What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the African Five-A-Side Podcast, brought to you by the good folks over at africasacountry.com. Uh, for those that don't know, the African Five-A-Side Podcast is a podcast in which we'll be exploring different themes in African football, but really ones that are beyond the game, you know, the socio-political aspects, the historic aspects, the economic aspects. And in the first match day, we've been looking at African heads of state and their relationship with football. We've already spoke about President Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt. We've already spoke about Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. We've already spoke about Mobutu Sasesoko of Congo. And now, this week, uh, we're going to be speaking about the fourth player on our five-a-side team of heads of state. And it's Ahmed Sekou Toure of Guinea. The man who said no to France and yes to football. Why do they call Ahmed Sekou Toure the man who said no to France? Um, Guinea at the time uh, was colonized by France in the late 50s and there was a referendum coming up um, in 1958 on if Guinea wanted to remain part of the French Republic or if they wanted to break away and be fully independent. So yes was to stay uh, within the French Republic, no was to break away and be independent. And Sekou Toure was very, very politically act- politically active, with the foremost political um, personality uh, in French Guinea at that time, as it was called. And uh, he was advocating for no, 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 no. And eventually, Guineans voted no, they voted for their independence, and Ahmed Sekouturi was forever known as the man who said no. And as we've spoken about, um, you know, the, of these post-colonial leaders, we had many who were hardline pan-Africanists, people like Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Ahmed Sekouturi was very much one of those, um, looking for a radical rip from, you know, the colonial yoke, uh, looking to rewrite history in the traditions of the country, um, not looking at all to really maintain relations relationships with the former colonizer, as other countries have been accused of doing. Countries like, for example, uh, their neighbors, the Ivory Coast, and we're going to explore that uh, as we talk about Ahmed Sekouturi's legacy in football uh, a lot. So, really, what's interesting here in terms of his policies is that he one of his foremost policies was really an education reform. Uh, some scholars have said he made up to 15. Um, and in the education reform, um, we're mostly talking about linguistic reforms, decolonizing the curriculum, you know, the history, changing the currency from the French franc to uh, event- the Guinean franc, and eventually it's going to be called the Sili. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, but what about sport? For, for Ahmed Sekoutoure, sport and culture, you know, they're pillars of his revolution, the revolution. Um, They're the soft power of the revolution. Um, And what he does is he splits the country up into different federations or, or, you know, let's call them provinces, but he calls them federations. And which which was a little bit bizarre because you'll see later that Guinea is very much centralized. It's very much a totem, uh, unipolar. Um, But initially he splits it up into federations and the federations sort of fall under the umbrella or the confederation of the of the PDG, which is the only party in Guinea at the time, Ahmed Sekouturi's party, the party that advocated for the no vote in the referendum. Um, and it's very much, you know, like all for one, one for all. You know, Ahmed Sekouturi said, Ahmed Sekouturi is Guinea, and Guinea is Ahmed Sekouturi. You know, it's like he, the cult of personality sort of dissolves into the, the country's fabric and vice versa for him. Um, just take a look at, for example, the, the silly, as we talked about. So the Sili in Susu, one of the local languages, means elephant. The Sili is the, if you look at the PDG, the political party's logo, it's an elephant. It's also the country's currency. Le Grand Sili, the big Sili, the big elephant, is Ahmed Sakouture. The national team is le Sili National. So you see, like, everything is, like, mixed up. Um, there's a mix between the, the cult of personality with the country, with the currency, with the, the, the only political party anyways. And that's very much what sport is. Sport is just a function of the revolution for Ahmed Sekouturi. You know, it's not something different. It's p- students or young people are activists for the party. They're within the respective federation. 
uh, and they're just practicing sport because it makes them stronger and they can work harder for the country and for the revolution and for the PDG and for Ahmed Sekouturi. You see, it's all very much blended in and very homogenous. So initially, Ahmed Sekouturi's idea of sport is grassroots. Really, it's about students, young people making their bodies stronger so they can work for the country. And this is very, very opposite to what his good friend Kwame Nkrumah was doing in Ghana. And for those that are interested in that, they can go on this very same channel and go listen to the Kwame Nkrumah episode. And you'll see how Kwame Nkrumah is more interested in uh, focusing on the elite, the creme de la creme, you know, on making a club that was uh, going to be Ghana's best club and that was going to take on all the other clubs in African football. He focused on the national team. He focused on the Confederation of African Football and sometimes neglecting, you know, uh, some of the domestic football clubs like Asante Katoko. No, Sekutori was very much the opposite. He was worried about, you know, everybody playing sports, you know, the sport for the masses, as he says. He's not too worried about the national team or, you know, having an elite club. But then he sees Kwame Nkrumah's success, and, you know, in using sport as a diplomatic tool because of that elitism. And, you know, the focus on trophies and, and CAF and, and, you know, diplomacy. And when he sees that, and, you know, when Kwame Nkrumah is deposed in 1966, where does he go? He goes to Guinea. And he's given the honorary co-president role and he's advising Sekouture. So we start to see by the end of the 1960s that sport is all of a sudden becoming less of a grassroots uh, thing where we're not worried about, you know, titles and results. We're more worried about the physical upkeep of the citizens. And now we're becoming more professional. For example, the clubs used to be called Conakry 1, which is a federation. Conakry 2, which is another federation. Now they're called AS Kalum Star. They're called Hafia FC. And we're going to focus on Hafia FC in this podcast because Hafia FC had a magical run between 1972 and 1978 that rewrote the history of African football. And this was very, very much spurred on by Ahmed Sekouture. And really, for me, this is the crux of this podcast. So, so let's talk about that Hafia FC team. Hafia means, uh, so, th- so they go from a club called Konakri 2 to Hafia FC. Hafia means, you know, like serenity, happiness. Um, I also believe in, in the Susu language. Um, and they had fantastic players. Sharif Suleiman the only Ghanaian player to ever win the African Ballon d'Or in 1972. Uh, he's really a jack of all trades. He could play, you know, as a number 10. He could play as a midfielder. Later on in his career, he played as a central defender. One of the finest players in African football history. Just could do everything. And, you know, if he were playing in this time, I think he would be playing in one of the top clubs in the Bundesliga because um, he, he had some experience living in Germany and he was very close to playing for those clubs. But Ahmed Sekouturi said, no, you're going to play in Guinea and you're going to help the revolution. Um, besides Sharif Suleiman, we had uh, players like Papa Kamara, a uh, great striker. He was a silver, uh, number two in, in African Ballon d'Or. <laughs> um, we had Bengali Sila, this, you know, little short. They had two great, short, fast, skillful wingers. Bengali Sila on the left, Petit Sori on the right. Uh, they had Maxime Kamara, who was more of a midfielder. Just This was a golden generation. And I think it was mostly because they were just playing football, you know, Initially, just for physical upkeep, but eventually they fell in love with it and, and they managed to come and play together for one club. And I think the strength of them was that they had a unified notion of what they wanted to do. And we're going to explore this very, very closely now. So in 1972, uh, Hafia makes it to the final of the African Cup of Champions Clubs, which is uh, now known as the CAF Champions League. Initially, it was known as the Kwame Nkrumah Cup, remember, as we spoke about in the Kwame Nkrumah episode, because Kwame Nkrumah in 1966 pushed CAF to create this competition and donated the trophy um, for this competition. And this was one of the things that I'm kind of nostalgic for in African football, because back in the day, uh, what happened was a politician or somebody would donate a trophy uh, to be used for a competition. And if a club or a national team won that trophy three times, they got to keep the trophy. So, for example, um, Ghana won the first African Cup of Nations trophy three times first, and they got to keep that trophy. I don't know where it is right now. (laughs) Some Ghanaians that I spoke to don't know where it is either. I hope it's still around. Um, But Kwame Nkrumah donated a cup. 
Um, the tournament was named after him. T.P. Mazembe, T.P. T.P. Engelbert, later called T.P. Mazembe, won the trophy twice in the late 60s. And they were the ones that were pushing to win it a third time. And, and Mobutu was kind of jealous of Nkrumah. And he wanted to be known as, you know, uh, you know, that kind of leader. And so he, you kind of felt like a rivalry between political leaders that they wanted their clubs to win the trophy three times so they could... It's kind of like, you know, capturing the flag. And if you win the trophy three times, then you can donate a trophy and name the competition after yourself. It's kind of narcissism, but it's interesting. <laughs> and so when Kwame Nkrumah is deposed in a coup in 1966, he's at his friend's... In his friend's country, Ahmed Sekouture. Sekouture also, I think, wants to win this trophy three times so he can honor his friend. Especially, especially when Kwame Nkrumah passes away in 1972, uh, and you know, he passes away really in in Europe, but really he was living in, in Guinea the entire time. So, anyways, uh, 72 they take on the Ugandan army side uh, called Simba. Most people know them as the Ugandan army. They win seven four on aggregate. When the players return, uh, they're on open, you know, double decker trucks um, heading back to the presidential palace. You know, uh, hundreds and thousands of people on cars, motorbikes, um, all the way to 15 kilometers from the airport to, to the presidential palace. Ahmed Sekouture congratulates them and listen to this terminology. Testifies to the, vi their, he says their win testifies to the vitality of the revolution. How about that? Excuse me while I take a drink. And Ahmed Sekouture then um organizes, you know, lots of parties. And this is really the first taste. This whets the appetite. And we see that not only did Sekouture uh, see that this was very popular with people, you know, winning uh, an African Cup, uh, African Cup of Champions Clubs tournament, but also he figured out that this gives his country and his clubs political influence on the continent. So let's talk about the quality of players. Um, Sharif Suleiman that year in 1972 wins the African Ballon d'Or, as we mentioned. Petit Sori and Maxime Kamara, the two other players that we mentioned, uh, mentioned, they go play in a tournament in Brazil um, to commemorate 150 years of independence. Petit Sori was named the best winger in the competition, despite, you know, Jairzinho uh, playing. Um, and yeah, so Hafia FC gets that first taste. Let's move on to the next year, 1973. 1973, <laughs> they play against Laurent Puku, in, who's playing for Asik Mimosa. They get past him. Then they lose to Roger Mila, uh, who's playing for, I believe, Toner Yaoundé. I believe Toner, not Canon. I might be mistaken, but I believe it's Toner. But this is what's really cool. I mean, when I'm reading back and researching this, look at the players that were playing in the Champions League at the time. Roger Mila, you know, uh, Salif Keita, Laurent Poku, Hassan Lalmas from Algeria, Godfrey Chitalu from Zambia, Samuel Mbappe Lepe from Cameroon, Mahmoud Al Khatib from Egypt. The best players in African football history were playing in the CAF Champions League. It's not the case anymore, you know, and I find that's a little bit of a shame. Anyways, they lose to Roger Mila, who obviously is one of maybe top five African strikers of all time. There's no shame in losing that year. 1974, look how Ahmed Sekouturi uses politics in football. They forfeit. Why do they forfeit? They forfeit because they're drawn with Jean d'Arc uh, from Senegal. Um, and at the time, Senegal and Guinea don't have any diplomatic relations. Senegal and Guinea and Senegal and Ivory Coast don't have any diplomatic relations. So Sekouturi says there's no way I'm sending a team over there. We don't have any diplomatic relations. There's no, there's no reason for our clubs to play one another as well. Um, and so they forfeit. And we saw uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser do this with the Egyptian national team at the 1965 Cup of Nations. Uh, I believe, I'm not sure if I remember if Mobutu did this as well, but this was something that you see, Gaddafi did this on several occasions. You see political leaders using their national teams and their club teams, uh, you know, interfering directly in the results for political means. So 1975, excuse me, I have a little bit of cotton mouth. I'm a little bit sick, excuse me. 1975, we're back in the final against Unugu Rangers of Nigeria. Um, in 1975, attendance at the match is decreed. <laughs> you have a new sports minister, Tumani Sangare, 
Um, and he calls on all football fanatics from the capital, from the interior of the country, come together and witness this match against Onugu Rangers. Um, and Pretty Sori scores a goal. And Pretty Sori, who we talked about, is one of the greatest players in Guinean history. He scored a goal and he had been detained for the last year and a half in one of Guinea's worst political prisons called Comp Comboiro. Camp Boiro, really, um, because he had contacts with a journalist that <laughs> was exiled in the Ivory Coast, who, remember, don't have diplomatic relations with Guinea. So it went that far, where Ahmed Sekouturi really was also known for his repression. There were, at times, anywhere from some estimates, say, 500 to uh, 1,500 political prisoners at a time. Some people estimate that he killed uh tens of thousands of political prisoners or, or opponents or or militants. So even football players, national heroes like Petit Sori, uh, were actually imprisoned. But he comes back just in time for this CAF Champions League final, scores a goal uh, away from home, I believe, uh, in the national stadium in Nigeria. And uh, Guinea, or sorry, Hafia FC beat Enugu Rangers. And uh, again, this is like pandemonium in the streets they all they're not really getting paid or not pay, pay, getting paid you know footballer wages um these players but they're given uh german made scooters um they're given bonuses um this time they get two thousand sillies um and conakry is celebrating and they're celebrating and and again they get invited to the presidential palace by ahmed sekuture and the captain tiam tolo the captain of Hafia, listen to this declaration he makes. Comrade, supreme leader of the revolution, he's talking to Ahmed Sekoutoure, we are happy and proud to have accomplished our duty to have kept the commitments we made on our return uh, when we had just won the Amical Cabral Cup. We promised that before the end of 1975, the cup bearing the glorious name of Kwame Nkrumah would join that of your august hands. Uh, Comrade, supreme leader of the revolution, we would like to remind you of a wish that we had already expressed, that wish of seeing this cup installed in the high command hall, which is in the, the presidential palace. And then long live President Ahmed Sekoutoure, long live the revolution, long live the sport for the masses, and we are ready for the revolution. That was his speech. This is a captain, <laughs> captain of a club making like a real political speech. Again, look at the language that they're using. This is a completely different era. This is not about the glory of clubs or the glory of players. This is, no, our victory on the pitch validates our political stances, your political stances as the leader of the, of the country. And, and again, I, like, I'm not saying like the players were, maybe he didn't write this speech. There's a good chance he didn't write this speech. I'm not saying the players fully bought into Ahmed Sekretori's political philosophies, but they understood that they were being instrumentalized, you know. This was there was no qualms about it. It was for sure. So they won in 72. 73 they fell victim to Roger Mila. 74 they forfeited. 75 they won against the Nugu Rangers. Now they have two CAF Champions League titles. Remember, Mazembe have two. Who's gonna be the first to get three and win the Kwame Nkrumah Cup definitively, honoring him? Jean Ahmed Sekouturi wants this trophy bad. 1976. Who do they get in the semifinals? Asik Mimosa, the Ivorians. <laughs> Remember, they have a huge beef with Guinea and Ivory Coast for from 1958 to 19, the mid-1970s, late 1970s. They are not friendly at all. And so the first leg takes place in the Ivory Coast. Asik Mimosa want to play this match in Bouake, not in Abidjan. And really the conditions, that <laughs> when you listen to the Ghanaian players describe it, traveling was horrible. Nobody was there to welcome them at the airport. The food was nasty, not even edible. People had food poisoning. Uh, stepping onto the pitch, people were spitting at them. When, uh, when the Ivor Ivorians scored a goal, people would run onto the pitch. Uh, when... Hafia players would protest against the referee for giving them a penalty. Uh, Army would run onto the pitch and hit the, the, the Ghanaian players. And you can actually find this match on YouTube if you type in Hafia 
Isaac Mimosa 1976. You'll find it for yourself. Um, but basically, the first, like, the Ghanaians were, ah, like, completely angry. And they knew that the second leg was two weeks later. And the, the protocol chief that was with Hafia goes back the next day. <laughs> and he has a slot to speak at the PDG Central Committee, which is, again, the, the only party uh, in Guinea, the party of Ahmed Sekouture. So you can imagine, like, imagine Manchester United playing a match in, I don't know, in Scotland against uh, Celtic Glasgow. They're mistreated. And the next day, Manchester United comes back and they're speaking at 10 Downing Street about what's happening. And they describe the conditions. And what does Ahmed Sekouture says? He says... Our enemies are not the young Ivorians. They are innocent. They are victims of their neo-colonial regime where the law of money places man in a social hierarchy. <laughs> we all know the method of corruption which prevails in the relations between certain Ivorian executives and the Ivorian people. He talks about the Zairean referee that accepted the money and that how that doesn't surprise him. It's just like, like he does not mince his words. <laughs> That's for sure. And, and what's described later is for the next two weeks, life is suspended. Everybody's, you know, waiting for this match. Um, and a oh, Hafia player later says that him and his comrades have never been subjected to that much spiritual healing. They had, you know, like washing sessions where they would be given holy water and they would put it on their body every single day. Um, and, and before the Repub before the match, the president of the Republic, Ahmed Sekoutoure, he, he visits the, the Hafia athletes Um and they play the match, and Hafia just destroys them. Um, they they score more than three goals, um, and as they're scoring goals, you have MIG fighter jets flying, <laughs> flying over the pitch. The Azak Mimosa players are scared out of their wits. One of the players didn't even make the trip because um, he was his father apparently I think was like had some was like a political opponent of Ahmed Sekouturi's, wasn't allowed there. And after the final whistle, you know. The crowd invades the pitch. They're carrying their heroes on their shoulders. Um, just a huge sigh of relief. It's probably... When, when I'm reading these accounts of this match, this is probably one of the greatest rivalry games in African football history. 1976, Hafia FC versus Asak Mimosa. So they get to the final. This is it. They're going to win their third Kwame Nkrumah trophy forever. Have it. They can honor the former honorary co-president, and they can name the next trophy. They fall against Muludia of Algiers, 1976. First match is in uh, Conakry. They win 3-0. Very confident. Second match is in Algiers. And in Conakry, 3-0, there was two, two players sent off. One of them was Ali bin Sheikh. At the time, probably the best Algerian player. One of the best players on the African continent as well. He was sent off in Conakry. Algeria, with all their political power and might, say that CAF made a mistake. The CAF match commissioner said, yeah, it wasn't really supposed to be a red card, and he gets to play in the return leg. And Muludia win 3-0. So 3-0 in Conakry, 3-0 in Algiers. They go to penalties. Muludia win 3-1 in penalties. First Champions League title for an Algerian club, and Hafia falls short of their dream of winning three consecutive titles. What happens? As soon as they get back, <laughs> as soon as they get back, everybody gets called to the presidential palace. They get a dressing down for hours, more than three hours. Ahmed Sekoutoura is criticizing. How could you guys play the match when they when they fielded an illegible player? You should have suspended. What are you doing? And then he's talking about the individual errors of the goalkeeping, this and that and that. Immediately, Minister of Youth and Sport the Tumani Sangari, who we spoke about in 1975, he's only been in the post for one year. Fired. Uh, Guinean Football Federation dissolved. The goalkeeper, Bernard Silla, and this one of the strikers, Njolea, one of the best strikers in Hafia in Africa at the time, suspended indefinitely from football. I mean, this is like almost like caricatural. You know, this is like, um, you know, the, the caricature of the African dictator that you have in your mind, like, oh, like, you know... You're going to punish your players because you lost the game? Yeah, that's exactly what Ahmed Sekoutour is doing. And, and even if you listen to like journalists at the time, like the Tunisian Fawzi Mahjoub, he says like, players were affected by this for a very long period of time. This was a real dressing down. It was a real humiliation. The next day in the newspaper, 17 of the pages 
17 of the pages were the speech that Ahmed Secretary gave the players where he was criticizing the players and the, and the delegation. 17 pages. <sighs> Anyways, this was like a real like traumatic experience for everybody. They were that close. But the very next year, Hearts of Oak in the second leg in Conakry, they made it back after that humiliation in Algiers. And this time the second leg is in Conakry. They have two weeks of prayers leading up to the match in the mosques, you know, so that Hafia can further the cause of the president of the republic. They have a tifo of Kwame Nkrumah in the stands. And this match is also on YouTube. You can look it up. 1977, Hafia FC versus Hearts of Oak. Do look it up. I, I really encourage you to. You can see the, the, the ambiance, the atmosphere. They have a tifo of Nkrumah. They have, you know, along the stadium, uh, long live the revolution. Uh, Sekuture arrives at halftime. <laughs> in um, what do you call the decapotable? Perhaps in halftime in um, uh, what do you call those cards? Those cards without a roof. Uh, I'm losing it. Anyways, he arrives in one of those cards without a roof, waving to the crowd. You know, with his handkerchief. Um, he makes a speech. You know, and Hafia win, and it's probably the biggest party. There are journalists from all over the place. Um, you know, France football. Everybody, all the French media, some British media, and they're all just celebrating, you know, Hafia finally winning that third CAF Champions League. The Afri at the time, the African Cup, African Cup of Champions Clubs or the Kwame Nkrumah Cup. And they finally win it. They honor their former honorary co-president. And Ahmed Sekoutoure gets to name the next trophy, the Ahmed Sekoutoure Cup which Zemalek ends up winning three times in the 90s, and they have uh, forever. But unfortunately, we don't have that tradition anymore because I think it's it's a hilarious tradition. So Hafia finally win that third uh, Champions League. And, and we, this is like a very dominant run. We don't have many runs like this where you have three Champions League titles, two runners-up in you know five, six years. This is very rare on the African continent. Recently, we've had it with Al-Ahli. But in the 70, 60s, 70s, 80s, no. But you could see that this is like, it was done because there was a unity of vision. All the players, the politicians, the government, they all said, we're doing this for a purpose. I mean, rightly or wrongly, you know, probably wrongly. They were instrumentalizing the players. They were, a lot of the players weren't, were miserable. But everybody understood why they were playing the game. And I think that, un, that you know, single track mind, that tunnel vision, that unity, I think that's what spurred them on eventually i mean Ghanaian football for the next five years after that really is not really in a great position um i mean they make some semi-finals as kalum star does hafia completely falls by the wayside there are a few different reasons for this some people say that they weren't focusing on grassroots football anymore they were more focused on you know just hafia as a club some people say that uh, Nabi Kamara, for example, the former coach of Hafia, said that the quality of the championship just degraded to a point where Hafia was not, for example, or the elite clubs were not really playing against good competition on a weekly basis. And as a result, um, they couldn't really play on, on at a great level at the continental competitions. So there are a few different theories, but I think, honestly, I think it's just that thing of we need to get that third Champions League. We need to get that third Champions League. We need to get it. And they finally get it. And then it's just like a mental relaxation from the players, administrators, and also from the president, Ahmed Sekou Touré. 1984, he passes away, and Guinean football has never been the same. And this has really been the running theme throughout this podcast series, is that when the politicians put the means and put the motivation, maybe in case of Ahmed Sekou Touré, put the fear in the hearts of the players, football, I mean, on a results basis, there's results to show for it, you know. But here is a very clear example of how Ahmed Sekouturi uses football to legitimize himself, to legitimize his revolution against what he thinks are traitors, neo-colonialists, counter-revolutionaries. He's mostly talking about his neighbors in Senegal in the Ivory Coast, unfortunately. He would later actually reconcile with Felix Oufoué Bonny, excuse me, in the Ivory Coast. And probably, I think he would recognize that he was maybe a little overzealous, but... That's the story of Ahmed Sekoutoure. Um, he is going to be 
for me in midfield. And he's going to play a Wilfred and Didi and Galo Conte role. He's going to be our destroyer simply because of how passionate he was. Um, and he believes in the cause, you know. I think he would have like 10 lungs. He would just be breaking up balls everywhere. So we have Gamarad the Nasser in goal. We have Kwame Nkrumah as a cool, calm, collected head in defense. We have Mobutu Sesesoko as our ferocious attacker. And we have Ahmed Sekouturi as our destroyer in midfield. That's it. It's been another episode of the African Five Side Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. We have one final installment where we're um, exploring, you know, heads of state and their relationship with football before we move to match day two, which is going to have a completely different theme. So, yeah, if you've enjoyed this, please do check out africasacountry.com. There are a few different pieces at the moment on uh, Henry Kissinger and his legacy on the African continent. Um, I think you're going to enjoy that. Um, and, yeah, keep it tuned in because we're going to be really starting to ramp up our coverage of the African Cup of Nations, which is only about a month away now. Cannot wait for that. So thanks for listening, uh, and we'll speak to you soon. Peace.